When you hear something like, so and so is destroying your favorite games, it may seem like a bit of a hyperbole. My favorite game is faring just fine, and the sheer range of quality titles available will likely support that notion. One is almost spoiled for choice, yet there are more games these days which carry that one nagging thing that you just can't ignore. That one seemingly inconsequential flaw that mars the entire experience in some way or another. Of course, you also have the trends which outright ruin some games with cool concepts or franchises with faithful fan bases, if not diminish interest in them entirely. Without further ado, here are 15 modern trends destroying your favorite games. Live service. It's 2019. BioWare has released Anthem, a terrible live service title antithetical to everything they're good at, where the mission design is simplistic to facilitate quickly churning out content, which is ironic given that the game's entire roadmap would be scrapped shortly after its launch. It's 2020. Crystal Dynamics and Adios Montreal have released Marvel's Avengers, a terrible live service title antithetical to everything they're good at where the action-adventure mechanics need to facilitate the co-op sandbox as much as impossible complexity be damned. It's 2024, and, well, you get the idea. Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League could have been a compelling follow-up to the Arkham series if it didn't go the live-service looter-shooter route. Similarly, Skull and Bones forced PvEVP and shared worlds and all that games as a service jazz. Live service games can be good if done right or in a fresh, engaging way that's not endlessly trying to fleece you. See Helldivers 2. But such titles are in the minority. Battle Passes At one point, Battle Passes seemed like they would be the future of monetization and gaming, but in a good way. Guaranteed cosmetics for a fixed price of $10 or so felt like a good deal compared to RNG loot boxes. More and more developers opted for the same approach, and suddenly, battle passes were just another monetization stream on top of the premium cash shop, with the paid tier skips, the deluxe versions of passes, and so on. It also didn't help that some titles offered battle passes on much shorter cycles. Some titles have ways to innovate on the approach and provide more freedom for players to choose their rewards. However, battle passes have long since outstayed their welcome. And they aren't going anywhere anytime soon, unfortunately. Gameplay Affecting Microtransactions When it comes to a title where hurdles are inherently part of the design, see Dragon's Dogma 2 and its limited fast travel, that selling items like port crystals to make that easier, it becomes a slippery slope. It's gotten to the point where Rift Crystals, something else you acquire naturally by playing, are being sold for real money to those who don't know any better. It's certainly not the best look for a title which launched for $70 and has so many problems with performance on platforms like PC. $70 for games Speaking of $70, it's quickly become the accepted price point for AAA titles and yearly sports titles. It could be viewed as a consequence of rising development costs and unstable economic conditions worldwide and wouldn't be too far off, but let's be real. So many publishers may not have adopted it if it saw significant backlash, or worse, declining sales. Would Microsoft have sought to charge $70 for Redfall if Sony hadn't paved the way? That too, given its technical state? We'll never know, but the trend has become popular enough that many publishers are getting in on the act on top of adopting other shady practices. Poor PC Ports I like to think that no game developer wants to release a terrible port of their game on PC. Yet, the range of substandard PC ports continue, the latest being Dragon's Dogma 2, with its shoddy frame rate in cities, even on the most powerful hardware. Sure, it may not affect sales, as evident by the Steam bestseller chart, but the fact that Horizon Forbidden West Complete Edition is one of the best PC ports yet and selling well, at least in the United States, per Circana, shows that you can have the best of both worlds. FOMO Fear of missing out, or FOMO, continues to be a useful tactic for driving players towards certain titles. It's one thing to play a game because everyone else is doing it and wanting to get caught up in the mass euphoria, but when FOMO extends to limited time content, much less microtransactions to assign more worth than what they deserve, it's a problem. Take the Cowboy Bebop collaboration in Overwatch 2. Are those skins really worth $25 a piece? Maybe not for some players, but they'll be gone soon, and who knows when they'll return. You should get them now, even if they join the sea of other skins you own. Early Access 
Calling it a pet peeve, but I hate early access for some titles. I'm not referring to early access in the sense of playing the game as it's developed over months or years, but rather pre-ordering or paying for the deluxe edition of a title to play it a few days before its worldwide launch. If it's an always online title, there's the risk of servers not being available due to excessive load, as seen with Diablo 4, not to mention issues like some player's story campaigns being auto-completed like in Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. Furthermore, various issues could crop up that will be fixed with the worldwide release, turning early access players into glorified beta testers for everyone else to drive pre-orders and launch revenue. Essential Features Locked Behind Paid DLC as much as the Like a Dragon series is worth getting into, seeing the developer block certain essential features behind DLC leaves a weird taste. Seeing a bonus dungeon locked behind the Master Vacation bundle for Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth is one thing, but New Game Plus, which isn't even implemented all that well? Options to invite party members to Dondonko Island or recruit them for your Sujimon team. Not one, but two jobs? It's a shame, pure and simple, and only worsened over time. Sequels Removing Features Whether it's Payday 3 or Overwatch 2, some sequels have this unhealthy habit at their respective launches of removing features that fans enjoyed from previous titles. The on-fire system and option to commend opponents may not have been the most game-changing features in the original Overwatch, but it still stung fans to see them gone. It's also outright annoying when the predecessor has so many quality of life features that can and should be carried over into the sequel like an unready button on pre-heist planning map, yet it's mysteriously absent in Payday 3 at launch. Triple A Budgets When Triple A is used more in a derogatory sense than as a sign of a game's quality, something's gone wrong. However, it's not just that the term has come to mean safer gameplay formulas or sequels to long-running franchises that don't rock the boat, but also budgets that are spiraling out of control. Marvel's Spider-Man 2 sold 10 million units as of February 2024, but its budget is absurd. It's almost like a bubble becoming more unsustainable as games grow bigger, and for all criticism about the lack of innovation for AAA gaming, it's all some publishers can do to keep the multi-billion dollar wheel churning. Until the bubble bursts, of course. Terrible Workplace Conditions I have said it several times, senseless and excessive crunch doesn't result in a better game. However, that can extend to terrible workplace conditions in general. Creating an unsafe environment for your employees doesn't raise the company's profile. A toxic work environment, as alleged with Blizzard, Ubisoft, and Activision on top of many other companies has not resulted in games like Diablo 4, Skull and Bones, or Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 2023 being better games. If nothing else, longtime fans who don't care about what's going on behind the scenes aren't getting a better product from all of this nonsense. Terrible Nintendo Switch Ports If some games have that one flaw resulting from modern trends that bugs you endlessly, but which you love regardless, try playing them on Nintendo Switch. You might like Mortal Kombat 1 despite its many, many problems, but the Switch version is a massive step down, and yet still an improvement over its launch with the horrendous visuals and missing content like much of Invasion Season 1. EA Sports FIFA titles on the Switch were an outright joke, essentially providing the same game every year with some roster updates and little else. Some developers like Asobo with a Plague Tale Requiem try getting around this with cloud-only versions of their titles, which subsequently faced loading, pop-in, jittery frame rates, and other issues. Always Online Call it an anti-piracy measure or just a way for developers to ensure that you're not using illicit means to unlock all of their microtransactions without spending money. Either way, from a gameplay perspective, the always online trend needs to go away. There's absolutely no reason why a game like Redfall shouldn't be playable offline, especially since it doesn't have a cash shop or microtransactions that players could gain. Even if it did, like Suicide Squad killed the Justice League, that's still no excuse for not offering online functionality. What happened if servers go down or there are connection errors, as has been happening lately? An offline mode for Redfall is still very much to be dated, while Suicide Squad is getting one later this year. But to not have these basic features at launch is just baffling. Layoffs Layoffs, especially this year, have become emblematic of many things in the gaming industry. Overhiring during the pandemic, failing to secure a major multi-billion dollar deal, not delivering on the promises of a console despite multiple acquisitions, expanding continuously even if industry growth isn't keeping pace, and now course correcting. 
and the list goes on. However, it's the developers and, by extension, the players suffering at the end of the day. Long-awaited titles are cancelled and fan-favorite studios are shuttered, which means certain franchises may never be seen again. Talent may also opt to leave the industry rather than deal with its various job insecurities and issues, thus driving down the pool of experienced developers. A lose-lose situation all around, and unfortunately, it's not so easily amended. Launching games before they're ready So basically like launching into early access, I hear you remarking. No, not quite, but rather pushing games out when they needed more time for well, everything. Quality control, squashing bugs, preparing a proper conclusion to your story, pick your poison. Some developers could keep working on their projects forever, adding onto them endlessly, or at least until the budget runs out. And thus, there comes a time when a project must ship. However, many publishers work based on fiscal quarters, targets, and projected revenues, and a game must meet those windows. Quality assurance be damned. Post-launch support becomes a joke in these cases, as the developers struggle to add features that clearly should have been included at launch. Hey, did you know that we at Gaming Bolt upload new videos every day? Stick around, drop a like, subscribe, and hit that bell. And let us know what kind of content you'd like to see in the future with a comment below.